International Relations, podcast lecture number four, Social Constructivism. As we've seen in the previous weeks, um, both realism and liberalism are rational theories, assuming that decision-making, be it by states, be it by leaders, be it by other actors, takes place on the basis of rational choice. So these theories assume that decision makers um, consult roughly their preferences for an outcome of a decision and then for each move that they can make calculate what the costs and benefits are in light of that preference. And this way decision makers are actually um, making their way through complex political puzzles. This was the dominant view up to the late 1980s, early 1990s. And it's still an important view in international relations. However, in the 1980s and 1990s, other social sciences, particularly sociology and anthropology, started becoming influential in international relations and started showing different aspects of human behavior and decision making. And this took the form of social constructivism, which argues that we are not just making rational choices, but that actually we come from a social setting which affects our decision making. So rather than seeing decision makers as individual free agents that make their own choice on the basis of their own preferences. Social constructivists emphasize that you're always coming from a social setting that informs you about what you think is important and how to get there. And that we cannot reduce decision making merely to rational choice. Also, social constructivists have criticized rationalism for blinding us for the importance of culture, values, and norms in international politics. Philosophically, social constructivism originates um, in the 19th century. Famously, Hegel already argued that uh, human civilization is sort of governed by a geist, something like a spirit, but that sort of much more in terms of a zeitgeist, of a worldview that actually um, affects the way in which humans organize and interact with one another in different epochs of our history. So that in different periods of time, society actually becomes quite a different thing and humans start interacting with one another on different bases according to the zeitgeist that they're in. Marx picks up clues from Hegel and argues that what we think and how we view the world and how we understand our position in the world actually doesn't come out of our rational analysis of the world, but rather comes out of our social condition. For Marx, if you are um, a part of the bourgeoisie, of the middle classes, the world is going to be considerably different for you than if you are part of the proletariat. And actually, it's the social setting that determines for you, to a large extent, the choices that you're going to be having and the way you're going to address those choices. And finally, Friedrich Nietzsche um, argued that that humans are herd animals, that we're actually um, socially motivated people that try to get together, stay together, and make things work for ourselves. But we've forgotten that, and we think that we're actually making rational choices, or making choices um, that allow us, for instance, to find the objective truth or falsity of things. And Nietzsche argues that this is just a way uh, that we have forgotten 
that we're trying to stick together as a flock, um, making things work for us in our societies. But it, in reality, we have no access to neither truth nor rationality. One of the ways in which social constructivism plays out in the 20th century is through the contradiction between the logic of consequence and the logic of appropriateness. Logic of consequence is what we called before the rational actor model. The idea that we weigh our, uh, the costs and benefits of each move that we make in light of the preference that we hold. And therefore, we make carefully uh, crafted decisions uh, based on um, calculation. Social constructivists, in turn, argue that we usually follow a different logic and what has been labeled the logic of appropriateness. Meaning that we do not actually calculate our moves so much, but rather that we just follow what is expected from us in our social setting. And usually we do so without thinking. Take yourself as an example. How many times on a regular day do you make actually calculated decisions about going to class, uh, going to eat, uh, meeting up with people, um, that kind of stuff? If you look carefully, you'll find that large part of your social behavior comes out of just doing what is the appropriate thing and fulfilling that with a certain kind of role, but is not a result of careful, rational analysis of the situation and which move to take next. This does not imply that we cannot be rational at all, but rather it suggests that most of the time we actually do not act rationally, um, and we just follow suit in light of the social context that we're in. So this plays out in a particular way between the agent and the structure. Two sociologists play an important role in this way of thinking. On one hand, Max Weber has defended the idea of the free rational choice, whereas Emil Durkheim has actually argued that we are being socialized into our actions. So for Weber, actors are free and individual agents who can calculate their move uh, wherever they are. So what social outcomes are, are then the accumulative actions of individuals. What a society is for Max Weber is basically uh, the, the accumulation of all the decisions that its members make. For Durkheim, the opposite counts. What a society is for Durkheim is actually the outcome of the way in which the members of society have been socialized into their social system. So for Durkheim, um, being part of a social system is being part of a social structure. And you are being structured according to the social rules that we have. So this leaves us with two accounts of social behavior and social action. On one hand, Weber comes with a bottom-up approach through which uh, we understand the world in terms of individual free agents, and Durkheim provides us with a top-down account in which act actors and agents are actually determined by the social structure that they're in. This contradiction has been most successfully been resolved by uh, in the 1980s by a sociologist called Anthony Giddens, who developed the idea of structuration. 
He argued that it's neither top-down or bottom-up, or actually it is both top-down and bottom-up. On the one hand, we are produced by our social structure, the way we understand the world, the uh, concepts that we think in, the language that, it ha that we have to understand the world with, etc., etc., come out of the social structure that we are embedded in. However, that doesn't leave us as completely determinated by that social structure. We have some form of agency. We can make a change, so to say. And our actions contribute to the social structure that we're in. So this means that we're in a constant dynamic. On the one hand, we are constantly being informed and shaped by the social structure that we're in. On the other hand, there's a certain amount of space that we have, discretionary space that allows us to move about in that social structure um, and make different choices and actually contribute to that structure in the longer term. So we end up in a continuous dynamic interaction between agency and structure. So this means that we go from a Weber versus Durkheimian top-down, bottom-up question towards a much more um, circular structure agent approach. And we're no longer uh, very much involved in social constructivism with the question of whether it's bottom-up or top-down, but rather in what ways do the structures that we live in affect our agencies and in what ways do our agency, does our agency actually affect the structure that we live in? So these are roughly the sociological and uh, philosophical backgrounds of social constructivism. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning of this podcast, social constructivism came up in the 1980s in international relations. Um, particularly the second part of the 1980s. But it was considered to be very marginal until, let's say, the late 1990s. One of the problems it had to fight was a sort of a stereotype of it not being scientific enough to be able to play with liberalism and realism. Whereas rational theories, uh, such as liberalism and realism, are able to calculate predictions for the future, um, the much more socially oriented um, uh, social constructivism was not able to come up with testable hypotheses, predictions, uh, or uh, game theoretic models. And this gave it a big disadvantage towards the competition. However, in recent decades, um, the competition has to budge, and in uh, nowadays, uh, approximately half of the IR scholars worldwide consider themselves to be something of constructivists. However, it should be noted that there's different kinds of construction constructivism floating about. Particularly in the United States, constructivism has become something like mm, a liberalism plus values or norms or identities or sometimes a realism plus values and norms and identities meaning that um, there's a sort of a combination between on the one hand materialistic capability analysis and rational choice approaches and that this is somehow combined with an analysis of how culture identity or values play into that game. Outside of the United States, um, and particularly in continental Europe, you see that constructivism takes a much more critical turn um, and gets to be much closer to postmodernism or post-structuralism, um, criticizing international relations for its rationalistic outlook and questioning um, much more the foundation of our knowledge of the world. Right. Uh, so there are different schools in constructivism 
in international relations. One of the most famous American schools is norms analysis, which has been championed by uh, Marta Finnemore, amongst others. And this school is focused on studying how norms develop and evolve. So it pretty much understands norms as an object of analysis. And in this way, uh, Finnemore studies what she calls the life cycle of norms, where certain norms are initiated by norm entrepreneurs, uh, become popularized, start cascading, start becoming self-reproductive, um, and then at some point become internalized by the major actors. So this can be, for instance, applied to the anti-whaling discourse, um, which you may well know that in the 1970s it was mostly Greenpeace and other uh, NGOs that were fighting the dominant whaling practices uh, worldwide. Um, and this anti-whaling norm became widely popular amongst Western countries and later also non-Western countries um, and actually cascaded up to the point that countries started implementing it in their own legislation right? and became an internalized feature of um, uh, most world politics with the notable exception of uh, countries like Japan. Um, you could do the same kind of analysis, for instance, for, for human rights. Right? Um, most of mainstream constructivism, which can be very broad, um, studies the role of social constructs in political settings. And in particularly, uh, the role of social facts. Social facts are facts that found, find their value, their importance, not so much in material origins or in military capabilities, but in social agreement. So, for instance, one of the most prominent social facts that we have worldwide is money. Uh, the value of a five euro note does not come from the paper or the production cost of the note. In fact, the production cost of money is almost completely irrelevant to the value of that money. The value of money does not come from any material source. Rather, it comes from a set of social arrangements, social agreements that we have of valuing money in certain ways. But in the end, Money is ungrounded except in social agreement. Similarly, you can see shifts in what things like terrorism mean. Right. So before 9-11, before uh, the attacks on the World Trade Center, um, you could hear a lot of talk in the media on the one hand about terrorism and on the other hand about groups that were called freedom fighters. Those could be, for instance, the FARC in Colombia or the Tamil Tigers in Sri Lanka. Um, the category of freedom fighters all but vanished after 9-11. After 9-11, all freedom fighter groups were generally lumped under the category of terrorists. One could say, well, who cares whether we call them freedom fighters or terrorists? It seems like to be a semantic issue. But if you are a freedom fighter and you consider yourself to be one, you'll find that it's actually quite important whether you're being called a freedom fighter or a terrorist. Because if you're labeled under the header of terrorists, you'll find yourself on all kinds of international terrorist lists, including uh, all kinds of um, uh, agreements on blocking your financial um, uh, uh, resources, um, uh, legitimizing governments to fight you much harder than if they were fighting freedom fighters, etc. So, the shifting of category 
freedom fighter to the category terrorist has had substantial material outcomes for those who considered themselves to be freedom fighters before that shift. Um, and interestingly, you see that after 9-11, the concept of freedom fighter disappears, but then in the Arab Spring re-emerges with slightly different association. And all of a sudden, the idea of fighting for freedom and democracy becomes once again accessible uh, for, for certain groups, uh, but other groups have lost out on that possibility, uh, such as the Tamil Tigers. You could do the same kind of analysis with security, um, as we'll see in the podcast on securitization. And security is not a fixed set of material conditions, but rather a social construct. We actually securitize things in certain degrees. So social constructivism focuses on the roles that social facts and culture play in international politics. And most social constructivism, most mainstream social constructivism, is um, not particularly critical of rationalist theories, but rather tries to add to them. Um, it is identified as a mainstream or middle ground theory. So what you'll see a lot in uh, mainstream constructivism is analysis that are based partially on material and rationalistic um, aspects and partially on elements such as culture or identities. And they try to mix those elements um, in a useful mix. One of the champions of this mainstream or this middle ground constructivism um, is the American scholar Alexander Wendt. Um, his piece, uh, his article, Anarchy is What States Make of It, 1991, was a groundbreaking uh, piece for social constructivism. And throughout his constructivist career, he has been trying to uphold the idea that the world of international politics is partly material and partly made of ideas, and that the art for social constructivism is to mix those in one coherent whole. And um, in this way, he can argue that anarchy is really out there. There's no doubt about it that anarchy is a force in international politics. But that doesn't mean that we can't construct it socially into different directions. Um, so that opens up the door that eventually we might be able to change anarchy into something different. More critical brands of constructivism take a much more critical perspective on, at knowledge and argue that actually not only part of the world is socially constructed, but actually pretty much everything is socially constructed. Uh, roughly the idea is that we do not have access to anything that's outside of our language, meaning that our language determines the world that we end up seeing. And this line of constructivism um, is mostly popular outside of the United States, but also uh, among certain circles in the United States. And is interested in the social construction of, for instance, the self and the other. How do social groups end up constructing themselves as certain kind of actors by constructing negatively the others that they're distancing themselves from. So to link this in with a current debate in Western Europe, um, there is a huge discussion about the role of Islam uh, and the way in which the West re should relate to Islam. Um, you see in this discussion that there is a very strong propensity of the West to identify itself in contrast to the Islam and where the West identifies itself as civilized, rational, um, and peaceful, it sort of constructs this self-image on the basis of contrasting it with the other, and the Islam as being non-rational, non-peaceful, 
um, and non-civilized. So you get a distinction between self and other that is the that is based on discourses that we can actually study and we can see the ways in which they not only influence politics but actually ground politics. One of the main voices of, of critical constructivism is uh, Nicholas Arnoff, who argues um, that the world isn't just a thing out there that we inhabit, but actually is a thing that we've made in many ways. The way we speak the world, he argues, is performative, meaning that if we understand and speak the world collectively on the basis of anarchy, we'll find that in the end we have a world that is anarchic. Not because it simply is that way, but rather because we have made it that way. We have socially constructed the world in terms of sovereignty and anarchy, and that social construction lies at the basis of the many practices that we have. And through those practices, we have stabilized the world into a shape of anarchy. Uh, um, so, this critical constructivism takes a much more radical view on the role that social constructs play in world politics. So, finally, some questions. There seems to be a distinction between social constructivism and theories like realism and liberalism in the sense that liberalism and realism come with sets of claims about how states behave, whereas social constructivism doesn't seem to do so. What kind of theory is social constructivism then? And does it come with a set of assumptions of what world politics is? Or is it just a lens that we can understand world politics in? Secondly, social constructivism emphasizes that we act socially. And in our everyday parlance, in our commonsensical understandings, what we mean with Social is actually not just a description of something, but also something normative, right? To be antisocial is to un is often understood as negative, well, as having social skill is understood as positive. So, does this imply that social constructivism is a sort of a nice or optimistic theory about human behavior, or could there be darker negative sides to? social behavior. Thirdly, middle ground constructivism tries to connect material causes such as military forces, etc. to ideas, norms, identities. Can we really do that? Are those categories that you can actually lump together somehow, and analyze in one piece of research? Or are those such fundamentally different categories that it's very difficult to actually combine them in one piece of research? And finally, if we would take the more critical social constructivist approach, that everything is a social construct, what is it that we're actually doing in international relations? What would it be that we would be studying? And why would we study it to begin with? Right? If, we, if, if material forces are irrelevant and everything is a social construct, should we continue international relations research the way we're doing it? What form should it take? What would the implications of the future of our discipline? 